One second, HCC. Is it on now? All right, good. That was bothering me. All right, you can go ahead. You can open up your Bibles uh, to the book of Acts. Uh, today we are going to be diving back into our study of the book of Acts. And I have uh, planned out the next few months here. And if it is the Lord's will, we'll be done with the book of Acts right at the end of March. You guys excited? I'm excited about that. You guys should be excited about that too. Um, a, couple, a, couple of, a couple other announcements before we begin today. Um, first of all, one of our church members, our dear saints, uh, Barb Pearl, uh, her husband, Don, uh, Barb Pearl, passed away. She went home to be with the Lord earlier this week. She passed away uh, on Monday, December 26th. And so uh, at this time, I just ask that all of you be praying for Don and their son, Jonas, uh, as they grieve her passing. And as of right now, they are planning a memorial service when the weather breaks, so springtime. And when that date becomes available, we will pass that on to you. Um, another announcement, I forgot to pass this on to Pastor Bretz to do, is uh, it is the beginning of the year. And so with that, many of you are challenge yourselves, and I challenge you, uh, to read through the Bible in a year. And so there are many good reading plans online which you can use. There's apps that you can download to your phone. Uh, to take up that particular challenge. Uh, what I have done is I have printed off several copies of a plan that you can utilize from Navigators. That's a parachurch organization. Uh, this, this particular plan has got it all laid out for you, and there's copies of it for you over on the table there. So this is a very good discipline that we as Christians, that we as followers of Jesus Christ, uh, that we need to be taking part in every single day, and that is consuming God's Word, reading God's Word, memorizing God's Word, and meditating on God's Word. And as we do so, God will be at work very powerfully in our lives and through our lives. And so uh, this year you can do that uh, with this plan. Like I said, there's a few copies over there um, if you do not have one yet already. And if you don't like this one, well, then you can go online and find your own, all right? So, uh, with that being said, we're going to be in Acts chapter 22 today. Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 22. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 22. And before we get to that text, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we come before you today, Lord, on this first day of the year. And uh, we want to thank you for what you have done for us in, this, in the previous year, in 2022. And God, I just ask that you who are holy, who are magnificent, who, who are sovereign, uh, who is loving, merciful, and gracious, that you would continue to be at work in our lives and through our lives in this upcoming year. I pray that you would continue to sanctify each and every single one of us. Make us more like your son, Jesus. God, I ask that you would give us opportunities to share the glorious good news about your son, Jesus Christ. How he is Savior and Lord of all. That we would have opportunities to share this good news to lost family members and friends and loved ones. God, I pray that you would give us the, the boldness to do so. And as we do share this good news, I ask that you would be at work powerfully in our listeners' lives, opening up their spiritual eyes, ears, and hearts to see, to hear, and to receive the truth. And that in so doing, you would transform their lives too, that you would take them from the children of wrath to your children, the sons and daughters of your own. And welcome them into your own family, Lord. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I just come before you now. I just ask that you would be with us as we continue in our study of the book of Acts. I pray that as we consider Paul's testimony, that we would give thoughts to our own story about how you and the gospel has changed our lives and transformed us. And God, I pray that you would give us once again an opportunity here soon to share our testimony, our story with somebody. And I pray that we would take advantage of it and that you would be at work in the words that we share with our listeners. God, ultimately, I come before you today. I want to thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We've just finished the Christmas season. I want to thank you for the ultimate gift of your son that you gave us some 2,000 years ago. I want to thank you for the forgiveness that we have in his name. I want to thank you for the redeemed relationship that we have with you. And I want to thank you for the hope that is truly eternal. Heavenly Father, once again, we just come before you. I just want to thank you for all that you have done for us. And I just pray this prayer in your son's powerful name, Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was growing up, uh, the church that my family and I attended, uh, they supported a unique missionary, I would say. This particular missionary, his name was Joseph Jennings, and he had a ministry he led, and he headed up the ministry entitled Second Chances Outreach. And Joseph Jennings, he had a dramatic testimony, a dramatic story about how he became a Christian, how God and the gospel of Jesus Christ dramatically changed to transform his life. Joseph Jennings, he, a big black guy who grew up in the inner city, and he was a former gang member, and he was shot he said 13 times, and he was stabbed numerous times. Yet his life was preserved by God's sovereign hand for a greater purpose. And then at some point in his life, an individual shared the gospel with him, completely did a 180 in his life, forced him to turn his life around. And I'll never forget whenever he would come and visit our church, which was once every two, three years or so, and he would share his testimony. Everybody in the congregation would literally be on the edge of their seats, just leaning in, listening to the story of his life. What about your testimony? What about the story of your life? If you were to sit down today with a lost family member or friend, how would you tell your story to them? Would you convey to them how God in the gospel of Jesus Christ changed you, transformed you, and is currently sanctifying you, making you more and more like your son Jesus? It is the first of the year, so it is this time in which we kind of go introspective, so to speak, and we evaluate our lives and we set out resolutions. And so uh, today is quite fitting, the text that we find ourselves in. And Paul here in this passage, he presents his testimony to a group of individuals who, let's just say, were not very keen with what he was doing or what he had to say. What about your testimony? What about your story? That is the one thing that I want you to be thinking about today as we go through this passage. And how would you present your story? How would you present your testimony to that lost loved one? Well, it's been about two months since we've been in the book of Acts. So let me just provide a real quick recap of what we've done so far in the previous 21 chapters. The book of Acts, just the big picture, the book of Acts, it is a historical narrative about the birth and the growth of the early Christian church. And this particular book, it has been understood by Bible scholars and even theologians as being composed of three advancing segments. And each one of these segments 
is actually seen in a verse at the very beginning of the book of Acts. And so I know I told you to turn to Acts chapter 22, so keep your finger there. And I want you to turn all the way back in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So Acts chapter 1, verse 8 provides us with the flow of the book of Acts, this historical narrative about the birth and the growth of the early church. And as we'll see in this verse here, there are three areas, there's three geographical locations that are specified which the book of Acts follows. So Acts chapter 1, verse 8, this is some of Jesus' very last words to his disciples. He said this to them, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So that's referring to the Pentecost, the birth of the early church. And then he goes on and he says, And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And so Acts chapters 1 through 7 it talks about the church's beginning at Pentecost, which happens in the very next chapter, chapter 2, and then also her establishment. You could also say her persecution in that particular town, in Jerusalem. Let's continue on in verse number 8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And so Acts chapters 8 through 12 talks about the church's outreach and growth into those two regions, into the regions of Judea and Samaria. And it talks about the first Gentile believers, the first non-Jewish people to come to see the truth about Jesus, that he is indeed the Savior and Lord of all. And then verse number 8 concludes with Jesus Christ saying, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so this corresponds to Acts chapters 13 through the end of the book, verse, or chapter 28. And these chapters here, Acts chapters 13 through 28, talks about the church's further expansion through the Apostle Paul's three missionary journeys. And I like to refer to them more as expeditions. Paul's three missionary expeditions throughout Asia Minor, Greece, and eventually to Rome. This is the known world at that point in time in history. And so our text today, you guys can go now to Acts chapter 22. <coughs> Our text today, Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 22, records the events that transpired following Paul's return to Jerusalem at the very end of his third missionary journey. After he evangelized and ministered along the northern shore of the eastern Mediterranean and the Aegean Sea. Now, at the beginning of Acts chapter 22, the beginning of this passage, the Apostle Paul, he is under arrest. He was arrested by the Roman authorities stationed in Jerusalem. And in the previous chapter, in Acts chapters 21, or Acts chapter 21, verse 28, there we see Paul. He was falsely accused by the Jewish people also worshiping in the Jerusalem temple as disturbing the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And they, these Jewish worshipers, they accused the Apostle Paul of being anti-Semitic, of being unbiblical, you could say anti-scriptural, as well as being sacrilegious. And so today, in Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 22, we will see that Paul, after he was taken into custody, and, his, and as he was held in the Roman barracks, and actually, I've got a map of that. Can I get that map right now? There we go. So Paul, he was in the Jerusalem temple, okay? And he was there doing his thing. And then you had these Jewish people, these Jewish individuals accused the Apostle Paul of being anti-Semitic, of being anti-scriptural and sacrilegious. And then the Roman authorities came down and they arrested Paul because they saw him as an instigator disturbing the Pax Romana, and they actually took him to the fortress Antonia. Antonio, or Antonia, excuse me, and that is up there in the corner. It is the structure adjacent to the Jewish temple, and that is where the Roman soldiers were located at, were stationed at, and that's where they took him, okay? 
So today what we are going to see, though, in Acts chapter 22 is that by God's grace, uh, the highest ranking commanding soldier, the Roman tribune, actually gave the Apostle Paul an opportunity to stand on the front porch, so to speak, of the Roman Antonia there, and to address the gathered angry mob of Jews who were essentially demanding his execution. And so that is where he is located. And so today as we go through this passage here, we're going to see Paul defending himself by presenting his Christian testimony to his accusers. And as he's presenting his testimony to his accusers, not only is he trying to justify himself, but even more so, he's trying to evangelize this angry Jewish mob who was after him. He wanted to see them saved with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted them to know the truth that Jesus was the Messiah whom they were all looking for, whom they were all yearning for. And so this morning, as we go through Paul's testimony here, once again, I want all of us to consider our own story, our own testimony. What has taken place in your own life? How God and the gospel has personally transformed you. One of the things that I feel God challenged me with over the last couple of years, and we got to get serious about it this year, is that we need to get out and we need to share this good news with others. Others who are outside these four walls. And HEC, let me tell you right now, one of the most powerful tools that you have in your back pocket when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to sharing the truth about Jesus Christ, is your own personal story, your testimony. Just by simply going out of these four walls and telling somebody about God and Jesus Christ and what they mean to you may have a very powerful influence in their lives. God may use the story of your life to dramatically transform their lives. So what is your story? What is your testimony? Let's go ahead. Let's read Paul's story here, Paul's testimony And I'm going to essentially read verses 1 all the way through 22, so hold on tight, okay? Brothers and fathers, this is once again Paul addressing this angry mob of Jews. Remember this, okay? And he's standing on these steps, kind of like what I am now, addressing this angry crowd here who wants him dead. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them, I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished, i.e. killed, executed. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, so in the middle of the day, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? 
And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all Jews who live there, came to me and standing by me and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. (coughs) For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this word they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. That is a dramatic testimony, is it not? So we're going to go through Paul's testimony here somewhat rather quickly, and we're going to see that Paul's testimony can be divided into four components. And I think these components here we can use to create our own testimony and sharing our own story to our lost loved ones. So the first, com- or the first component is Paul's commencement. If we take a look at the very first two verses there, we see Paul's commencement to his testimony. You could say his introduction. First in this opening segment, Paul is depicted making a deliberate effort. There are two ways in which he makes this deliberate effort to calm and to connect the angry Jewish mobs. Remember, these mobs, they want this mob of angry Jews, they wanted him dead. So he needed to kind of calm things down a little bit. So first, in verse 1, Paul politely greeted his accusers with respect. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. So with this greeting, I believe Paul calmed his listeners, not by calling them names. He didn't start off his testimony by saying, you think I'm anti-Semitic? Well, you're anti-Semitic. Oh, you think I'm sacrilegious? No, you're sacrilegious. He didn't do that. But he treated them with respect. He greeted them with, his, with, with respect. And in doing so, he calmed his listeners down. And he did that by acknowledging their shared ethnic bond. He refers to them as brothers, right? You and I, we, have this, we come from the same background. We are all Jews here. Not only did he identify with them in that particular way, by acknowledging their shared ethnic background, but also by honoring those in that angry crowd who held on to some high-ranking religious positions by referring to them as fathers. So with this greeting, Paul is seen, you could say, following the instruction of Peter, who in just a few years would write in his own letter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, that Christians, that they are to honor everyone, that they are to love the brotherhood, that they are to fear God, and that they are also to 
honor the emperor. And the emperor at that time was not very keen of Christians, was not on the Christian side of the discussion, was against Christians. Nonetheless, Peter here says we need to honor those in authority. We see Paul doing the same thing with this angry Jewish crowd. And then in verse 2, after Paul greeted his accusers with respect, we see him continuing to gain his accusers' respect. And he did that by addressing them in the Hebrew language. This would have been an unexpected yet a pleasant surprise to his listeners. Just a few verses earlier when he was interacting with the Roman authorities, he spoke in Greek to them, revealing that he was an educated man. But now with this angry mob of Jews, Paul spoke to them in their shared, cherished vernacular, that is Aramaic. And so by communicating publicly to them with this, in this particular Hebrew dialect, Paul began to connect with the Jewish mob by revealing to them that he too was not ashamed of his Jewish heritage as he was previously accused of being anti-Semitic. So HEC, we can learn something here from these first two verses. As we begin to share our testimony, as we begin to share our story with others, we are to do so in two primary ways. We are to, first of all, be courteous, right? You just can't go up to somebody and say, you're an idiot, you're a numbskull, listen to me. That doesn't tend to go over very well, does it? So the first thing that we can simply do is do what Peter told his readers to do, to honor everyone, even honor the emperor, honor those who are against you, who hate you. That kind of sounds like something that Jesus said, right? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So first of all, we just simply need to be nice. I think of, oh, I'm going to butcher the name of this church. It's a Westboro Baptist. I think that they are a small, independent church, and they're the ones who are seen on the sidewalks of funerals of military members, you know, with these big, huge, nasty signs, and they're yelling at and shouting down everybody who's, who's going into those funerals. That's not the way that the Apostle Paul demonstrated how we ought to share the good news with others. So first of all, we just need to be courteous. We need to be nice. Second of all, we need to, if we can, if there is one, and there is ultimately, we'll get to it in just a second here, but we need to identify a commonality. If we have some type of a common interest that we share with our listeners, it might be a, a way in, so to speak, to that person's heart. So we need to capitalize on our shared interests. It might be a profession. It might be a background that we have. Oh, you're from Waterford? I grew up in Waterford, too. Oh, you're from Highland or you're from Milford? We're from there, too. Or, hey, you like the Detroit Lions? I like the Detroit Lions, too. Now let me tell you about Jesus, all right? So we need to be courteous and we need to identify a commonality. Those are two ways, just kind of common sense ways in which we ought to start our, start to share our story, start to share our testimony with non-believers. Let's go back to our text in verses uh, 3 through 5, after commencing his testimony by connecting and calming the angry Jewish mob. Notice, hold on, go back to the very end of verse 2 there. Notice how it says that they became even more quiet. I like that. I think that's pretty cool. Instead of yelling at him, like, kill him, get him out of our face. We see that just by connecting with them, he's, he's calming them down. But the second component here is found in verses 3 through 5. Verses 3 through 5, Paul began to present his testimony by informing his listeners about his Jewish upbringing. So this component addressed the accusations in verse 28 that Paul was 
anti-Semitic and anti-scriptural. And so what I'm going to say here is that, yeah, we do need to, at some point, defend our beliefs. This is, once again, what Peter says in 1 Peter, I think in chapter 3. Always be prepared to make a defense for the reason of the hope that you have as Christians. So we do need to be well rehearsed in making the defense of our beliefs in Jesus Christ. But here we see Paul defending the accusations that were lobbed against him. First of all, in verse 3, Paul informed his Jewish listeners about his Jewish childhood. Even though he was born in Tarsus, and Tarsus was a distinguished city in Asia Minor, Paul then claimed to have been brought up in this city, that is, Jerusalem. So apparently, very early on in his life, he and his family moved from Tarsus to Jerusalem. And there he spent the majority of his childhood, and there he grew up, so to speak. And being raised in Jerusalem, Paul then went on to convey how he received a thorough Jewish education. He was privileged to have learned at the renowned Jewish rabbi Gamaliel. And Gamaliel, well known in New Testament times, and so sitting at Gamaliel's feet, Gamaliel cultivated within Paul a strict adherence and a zealous passion for the Old Testament commandments and customs. Paul loved his background. Paul loved his Jewish upbringing. He was not ashamed of it in any way, shape, or form. He was not, by any stretch of the imagination, anti-Semitic. He had a deep love for his Jewish brothers and sisters. He wanted to see them all saved. He wanted them to see that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. Verses 4 through 5, Paul then continued to inform his Jewish listeners about his ascending Jewish career. Impassioned by his strong Jewish convictions, Paul describes then how he sought to protect Judaism by becoming an officially sanctioned persecutor of those belonging to the way, that is, Christians, those belonging to the church. And so ardently seeking to preserve Judaism's purity in Israel, Paul recalled to this angry mob of Jewish people how he traveled to neighboring regions and towns in order to hunt down, in order to imprison, in order to sentence to death Christians. Now, even though Paul accomplished a lot in his life, he accomplished a ton in his life. He had a lot to be proud of. Paul was not proud of his past. In fact, he was keenly aware of what he was guilty of. If we were to continue reading about Paul, we would see in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, that Paul praised Jesus for saving him because he identified himself as the worst of sinners. So HCC, when we share our testimony, when we share our story with others, while we ought not to dwell on our past, it is absolutely essential that we are brutally honest about it. In so doing, we are identifying the ultimate commonality that each and every single one of us share. That all of us here are sinners in need of a Savior. So Paul, in presenting his past here about how he was raised in Jerusalem and how he cultivated within himself this deep yearning to keep Jew, or Judaism pure, and then how he went out and persecuted Christians. He did not wear that as a badge of honor. He was actually pretty ashamed of that. And he's essentially saying, this is what God in the gospel has saved me from. 
HCC, when we share our testimony, when we share our story with others, while we ought not to dwell on our past, it is essential that we are honest about it. And so doing, once again, we are proclaiming, I'm a sinner just like everybody else. Yet Jesus is my Savior. And Jesus, he has saved me from Satan's lies. He has saved me from sin's destructive powers. And he has ultimately saved me from eternal death. If I can say this, there are many people who have dramatic testimonies. Dramatic stories. And if, if, if I can, if you would allow me to critique these dramatic testimonies one of the faults that I find with them is that oftentimes the spotlight is kept on that individual's past. The spotlight, the attention, is consumed with that particular individual's sinful lifestyles. All of the drugs that they were into or all of the you know, sex that they had or whatever else it may be. The attention isn't given to the proper place. We'll get to that in just a second. So when you're sitting there and you're thinking about your testimony, keep that in mind. Yes, definitely. We need to be honest about our past. If we're not honest about our past, what happens is that we come across as being spiritually superior than everybody else, right? But by being honest about our paths, we put ourselves on the same spiritual plane as everybody else. We're sinners just like you. We are no different. We are by far not any better than our, than our listeners. You guys with me? So we need to get off of our high horse a little bit when we share our testimonies. Verses 6 through 16, we see the third component of Paul's story, of Paul's testimony. We see Paul's conversion. And if you'll notice, this takes up the majority of his story. Keep that in mind. In verses 6 through 7, Paul detailed the events preceding his conversion. One day, Paul said, as he was traveling to Jerusalem, or from Jerusalem to Damascus, and Damascus was a major city located about 160 miles north in the region of Syria. There was a major Jewish population that resided there, so he was going as a faithful Jew to make sure that that population remained pure and faithful to the teachings of the Old Testament, that they were not being infiltrated by this new teaching, identifying Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Paul says that as he was going to Damascus, and there he was going, to, he went with the intention to discover and detain these newly minted Christians, and he was going to have them extradited back to Jerusalem for execution. As he's making his way, Paul says, suddenly a great light appeared. Once again, in the middle of the day, so the sun is probably already out, high noon, so to speak. Paul's on his way, and all of a sudden, suddenly a great light. This great light is so powerful. It is supernatural in nature. It physically forces him to the ground. Not only does it physically force him to the ground, it also causes him to lose his sight, to go blind. So following this confrontation of sorts, I would say a supernatural, even a violent confrontation. In verse 8, Paul went on to tell his Jewish listeners how upon hitting the ground, he heard a voice questioning. Probably a better word would be confronting, convicting him by saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? At this point, Paul doesn't know who's talking to him. Definitely recognizes the authority of this person speaking to him. And so, wanting to know this individual's identity, he cries out, Who are you, Lord? 
And then in the second half of verse 8, Paul reveals to his Jewish listeners the response that he received on that fateful day. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. In that exact moment, at that precise moment in time, Paul's life was completely transformed. He went from a persecutor of Jesus to a promoter of Jesus. He knew that this voice that was speaking to him was infinitely greater than he, and that he needed to submit his life to him completely. So in verses 8 through 16, (coughs) Paul then went on to detail the events following his conversion. In submission to Jesus, to Jesus' absolute authority, and in obedience to his instruction, Paul said that he was taken on to Damascus. And once there, Paul told his Jewish listeners in verse 12 how a very faithful man named Ananias, a faithful Jew, he was well spoken of, he had a good reputation, came to him in Damascus and ministered to him. And ministered to him in verse 14 by telling Paul that, quote, the God of their fathers, that is Yahweh, the one true God, appointed him to know his will, to see the righteous one. That right there is an Old Testament title for the Messiah. You can see that in Isaiah chapter 53. And not only to see the righteous one in his brilliance, but also to hear a voice from his mouth, to know the truth about him, to know the truth about Jesus and to be saved. Jesus had completely transformed Paul's life. Because of that, Paul was absolutely enamored and he was forever indebted to Jesus. Jesus was not only here the main character of Paul's testimony, but you could also say very easily that Jesus was the main thing in Paul's life. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says this, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. As you see, when we share our testimony, when we share our story about how God and the gospel has transformed us, Who is the main character in your story, in your testimony? Or should I say, who or what is the main thing in your life? When we put together our story, our testimony, we need to make sure that we put Jesus at the center of it. That he is the main character in our story. We need to be telling others about who Jesus is. We need to be telling others about what Jesus has done. We need to be telling others about how Jesus has and is transforming our lives. This is what we need to be telling our listeners. Because at the end of the day, you cannot save anyone. Your or a story all about you can't really do diddly squat when it comes to an eternal reality. There's only one person who can transform, who can change people, and that is Jesus. So when we put our testimonies together, when we share our stories, we need to make sure that it's all about Jesus. We come to the final component of Paul's story, of Paul's testimony in verses 17 through 22. Amazingly, at this point, Paul's Jewish listeners, they were not angered. They were not upset at the mention of Jesus' name. Perhaps they were sincerely, perhaps they were sincerely listening to what Paul had to say about Jesus. Perhaps they were giving some thoughts about this Jesus person whom they heard Paul and others talking about. Well, in spite of their 
apparent interests. Their calmness did not last too long. Verses 17 through 22, we see at the end of this section that they became quickly upset when Paul then shared with them his commissioning. In this passage, Paul refers to, beginning in verse 17, Paul refers to another incident, another supernatural incident that took place in his life in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem approximately three years after his conversion experience on the way to Damascus. Verses 17 and 18, he states that one day while he was in the temple praying, he received another supernatural vision of Jesus. In this divine revelation, Jesus, first of all, informed Paul that he needed to get out of town, that the Jewish people, that they had rejected him, they had rejected his message, that is the gospel, and that his life was at stake. And then in verse 21, Paul went on to convey to his Jewish listeners, that on that fateful day, another fateful day in his life, Jesus personally commissioned him by saying in verse 21, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. It is at that moment when Paul is sharing his testimony before his listeners, before this angry Jewish mob that was for a temporary period of time calmed, upon hearing that word Gentile, upon hearing Paul's commission by Jesus Christ to go to the Gentiles, it is at that point when they lost it. Upon hearing Paul's claim that he was divinely commissioned to forego the Jews and instead minister to the Gentiles, Paul's listeners became instantly upset. In fact, in verse 22, it says that they became enraged and they demanded, away with such a fellow from the earth. It's not that they were just saying, get him out of town. Get him off of our planet. We want him dead, for he should not be allowed to live. We see here that the Jewish people, you that they were very prideful when it came to their ethnicity, when it came to their background, when it came to their upbringing. You could even say in today's terms that they were at that point a little racist. They did not care for hearing this good news being shared with others outside of their family. And it angered them greatly. Nonetheless, Paul, he was bold in sharing his story, his, his testimony. He was not ashamed to tell others about how God was working in and directing his life. Paul, he was bold in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was not ashamed to tell others the truth, even if it offended his listeners. Paul was well aware of the fact that as he did share his testimony with others, that there would be some who would express interest in his story and what he had to say, and yet he was also well aware of the fact that there would be others who would be appalled by his story. HGC, when we share our testimony, when we share our stories about how God and the gospel has transformed our lives, we, just like Paul, we need to be bold in declaring the truth. We cannot be afraid to offend our listeners. We ought to be more afraid of offending the one true God who sent us to tell this good news to others. While the response of our listeners is outside of our control, I think we need to keep two related matters in, in, in mind. First of all, we need to know that God is in control. He will use our testimony whichever way he best deems fit. So as we share our testimony, as we share our stories with others, we will see some 
who will come to be converted, who will come to see the truth about Jesus, and they too will place their faith, their trust in him. Praise God, right? Yet there will be others, as we share our story, as we share our testimony, who will be convicted of their sins. And there will be others who will ultimately be condemned by what we have told them. The response, though, is not up to us. Their response is not in our hands. The response is ultimately in God's control. There is one thing, though, that is in our control, and this is the second matter. Not only do we need to keep in mind that God is in control, but we also need to keep in mind that we have been called to be faithful in declaring it. This is the message that constantly needs to be on the tip of our tongues. This is the message that we need to be seeking to get out. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus, he tells his listeners a parable about individuals who have been given certain talents by their masters, and and their master departs and their master comes back. And there are some of those servants who have done well, who have been faithful, And those particular servants, the master tells them, well done, good, and not fruitful servant, but faithful servant. So we need to be faithful to what God has commanded us to do. And what has he told us to do? What has he commanded us to do? To go and to share the good news. So HGC, what's your testimony What's the story of your life? How has God and how has the gospel saved you and transformed you? The greatest testimony I think given is not necessarily one that is dramatic like Joseph Jennings or even the Apostle Paul's here. I think one of the greatest testimony is that of one who is faithful. Faithful to God, faithful to his word, and obedient in carrying it out. That is a dramatic testimony. That is one which people will look at and stand back after a period of time and give some consideration to. That is one I know God will use in a very significant way in transforming others' lives. So here is my 2023 New Year's challenge to you. If we were to have the last words today, this is what we would be doing. This is my challenge for you, though, in this new year. I need you to go home and I need you to write out your testimony. You need to write out your story about how God and the gospel of Jesus Christ has transformed you. This is a good practice for us to do, I would say, on a yearly basis. Something that I haven't done in a while. So that is the first thing. There's two parts to this. The second challenge for you in this new year is then to share your testimony. Share your testimony with someone. Someone who God has laid on your hearts. Someone whom you feel that God, or who you feel that they need to hear the good news about Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's go to the Lord now in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord. We want to thank you so much for all that you have done for us. We want to thank you. For your word, we want to thank you for the scriptures and how you